Uh, no, this is uh, Should the Jews Leave Europe, based on a, um, uh, an article by Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic a few months ago. Uh, I, my name is David Brooks. I'm a New York Times columnist. Uh, this is Jeffrey Goldberg, who's a correspondent for The Atlantic, formerly of The New Yorker, formerly of The Forward, formerly of the IDF. Uh, and our union has been sanctified by the Supreme Court as of last week. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we last appeared uh, at the comedy uh, night at Belly Up. <laughs> if you think we were funny about sex, wait till you hear us about anti-Semitism. We're a riot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're going to try to change the tone here. It's going so, okay. so badly so far. It's really <laughs> awesome. Okay, a serious question. We're going to start with a serious question. Uh, Jeffrey spent uh, many months over in uh, Paris, in Brussels, across Europe, reporting on this subject. And just tell us, you know, what it felt like to, uh, what the people you met felt like, what, how much anti-Semitism is there in Europe, how much is it as part of daily life? Uh, just how, how was it? Uh, the, uh, what's a good question, David? Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> It's a, compli it's a complicated question because, you know, one of, the, um, one of the tropes that you hear is that in Europe it's 1933 or it's 1938 all over again. Um, and in the, in the Atlantic piece that I did, um, I argued, you know, I argued that this is a serious problem. I argued against that idea for a number of reasons which we can, which we can go into. And one of them, just, it's just provoked by, the, by one, of the, one of the questions you asked. Um, one, one of them is that um, Europe is fairly to very safe for Jews who have disassociated themselves from Judaism. Obviously, in 1939 or in the 40s, early 40s, obviously, it didn't matter whether you were religious, not religious, half Jewish, fully Jewish. It, it, you, there was a biological determination of who was Jewish, and that was, that was your fate. Um, what, what the danger in Europe, uh, the danger in Europe is for people who um, want to participate in the life of uh, uh, the Jewish communities, uh, uh, participate in the life of Judaism. In other words, you can, if you, you isolate yourself from that, um, you could be safe. If you want to go to a synagogue on Shabbat or on a holiday, if you want your children to go to a Jewish school or a Jewish camp, if you want to visit a Jewish museum, then it becomes a whole other issue. I mean, the, so, so the story, the, the, the story that I wrote was prompted by Two, two events. The, 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 the first was the massacre at a Jewish school in Toulouse three years ago. And then it sort of what, something that gave me more impetus was the massacre at the Brussels Jewish Museum. And so, you know, what it, what it is, is, is is if the Jewish person is near a Jewish institution or, or at a Jewish institution, then, then there is a danger level that's much higher than, 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 than you would find in, in certain other places but in the if, world. If you're having a dinner party in Paris or Madrid or London, it's not part of your daily life? Well, there's not a lot of Jews in Madrid because they were kicked out in 1492, which was, I, I think, a mistake on the part of the Spanish government. Um, but, um, um, I mean, they, today they'd be a second-rate power instead of a third-rate power, but that's just my chauvinist view of the world. Um, the, uh, no, no, I mean, and it, look, there, there are discomforting aspects to being Jewish in, in Europe that you might not have here, um, which is that, right, for instance, the, 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 the narrative uh, or the dialogue about the Middle East is obviously very geared in one direction as opposed to kind of a split here. Uh, there is, look, this is, let me step back and, and make the obvious point that in one sense, the, the rise or return of anti-Semitism in Europe is the least surprising story in the history of the world. I, I mean, you know, it, this, this is, Europe is the crucible of anti-Semitism for the past thousand years. Uh, you know, and Lord Sachs, uh, the, the former chief rabbi of Great Britain, who many of you have heard or read and you know him, um, makes the point that Europe has introduced to the world lexicon of, of hatred such words as crusade and pogrom and auto de fe, concentration camp, arbeit mach, you know, he, he, he makes the very acid but true point that this is where it's at. Um, so, so the last period of time, post-Holocaust to 10 or 15 years ago, was kind of an odd dispensation period in, in, in the history of, of Europe. Um, but so to, to go to your dinner party question, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable in Europe because the, an, the, the ambient kind of feeling is slightly more anti-Semitic than here. Um, and, and, and you see this in polls. Uh, it varies from country to country. But certain stereotypes that are considered, you know, antique here or outre or whatever are 
trafficked in a little bit more, some more pernicious stereotypes about Jewish power or the role of Jews in finance, media, or whatever are heard more frequently. Um, but the danger, the, the immediate danger, is not traditional European Christian motivated or, or right-wing anti-Semitic. The, the physical danger at the moment is jihadist anti-Semitism, which evinces itself in, in, in physical acts of, of terror. Uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you, this is, so you wanna know, you wanna know the, 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 of all the, the schools I visited where the children feel besieged and all the synagogues that are, you know, between, you know, are, are guarded by 20 French paratroopers, which is sort of an astonishing thing to see um, just outside Paris. Um, the, the line that I heard that most kind of affected my view and made me, not that I'm happy every day to be an American Jew as opposed to a European Jew, but made me happier than usual to be an American Jew, um, was the, the chief rabbi of Denmark, which of course sounds like a pretty easy job as these things go. Um, you know, I, uh, you play with Lego and you, I don't know what you, uh, I, 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 I mean, it seems like, I, how hard could that be, right? There's eight Jews, right? Um, <laughs> eight Jews in seven synagogues, right? Um, the, uh, but he, he was, a, he the was, Lego the, the, Le Le <laughs> the Lego mikvah, or the Lego mikvah, the, but he was asked, he was asked, uh, you know, describe the level of anti-Semitism in your country. This is right after the attack on a, on a synagogue that killed a Jewish volunteer security guard. Uh, and he said, look, you know, most of the time it's, 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 it's completely fine. It's just being cursed out on the street or spat upon. And I thought that, that is, you know, defining deviancy down. It's the, it's the soft bigotry of low expectations, whatever you want to call it. It's, 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 you say that to an Israeli Jew or an American Jew, a North American Jew. Uh, yeah, it's not really anti-Semitic here. They just, every so often they spit on you. And, and we would react by saying, that's, that's, that's insane, and the fact that you accept that is debasing, but, but that's kind of the, 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 the feeling that I picked give, up. Give us some specificity. You have a lot of cases in uh, your, the piece. The, the ones that struck me were some of the students walking down the hallway, a rabbi walking down the street. Just describe some of the one or two yeah. of the things that yeah. So, crazy. so here's another thing that kind of uh, another another story that it, it's less dramatic than obviously terrorist violence against the synagogue, but it, it really struck me as uh, as, a, as a sad as a sad commentary about the state of things. I went to a, a Jewish high school in one of the suburbs of Paris, um, and as as you know, it's the the suburbs uh, in Paris are the tougher places than what's going on in the city. Uh, in the suburbs, you have a lot of working class uh, Muslim families, immigrants from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Jewish working class immigrants from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. Um, and so they're, they're close up and, and, and um, there's a high level of anti-Semitic harassment on the streets. And so getting to the Jewish schools is, is somewhat difficult. Once they're in, it's, it's, it's fairly safe and they're kind of like these islands. And so I went to a few of these schools just to understand the dynamic. Um, a couple of the kids in one of these schools told me the, the following. Now I knew, and we've read stories about this, that, that Jews in the suburbs, um, have been taking down the mezuzot, the mezuzahs, on their doorways. For those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a little uh, kind of scroll in a metal or wood piece. It's a, verses from the Bible, and it's there as a kind of protective, you know, amulet kind of, uh, kind of thing. And you, you put it on your doorpost of your home. It's rooted, obviously, in the Bible. Um, and they've been taking them down because they don't want people to know that Jews live in those apartments, which is obviously, again, if to, to, from my standard of self-respect. It's like, if you got to do that and there's someplace else for you to go, then maybe you ought to go. But this is the permutation that I heard that actually made me very sad. The permutation is that, is that in apartment buildings, apartment houses where, where there are a lot of Jews, um, that neighbors have been now going or had been going to other neighbors who had left their mezuzahs on the doorpost and, and demanding that they take them down. Jewish neighbors, not Muslim neighbors, not Christian neighbors, but, but Jews who are so scared that people would find out that any Jews at all live in the building that they're telling them to go hide their identity. Now, of course, you know, like in the, in the long history of anti-Semitism, that doesn't sound like the most dramatic thing that's ever happened, but this is happening in 2015 in France. Yeah, we're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about Iran. We're not talking about some, some you know, miserable, difficult place. Uh, and so that was, you know, and then so, you know, the rabbi walking down the street, I wrote, I, I, I had a line in this, in this piece. Uh, I think I discovered the most persecuted Jew in Europe. He lives in Malmo, Sweden, which had three years ago 2,500 Jews. Now it has 1,000. They're, 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 they're running away. They're under intense uh, street-level harassment pressure. Um, and this rabbi, this is a, I mean, it's, 
it, it's it's I, I don't mean to, to joke about it. he's a Chabad rabbi, a Lubavitch rabbi, those of you who know, you know, it's the Hasidic movement that's kind of proselytizing among Jews. Um, he's the only one who dresses in an identifiably Jewish Orthodox way. And, you know, and I, and I and there's a Chabad house just down the street here, and it's like I don't know how they some guy one guy one rabbi gets the Aspen Chabad house and the other guy gets the Malmo. I I, I don't know how you how you draw that straw, but um, anyway, he drew that straw, and he told me, uh, yeah, he's a nice guy from Brooklyn, whatever. He told me that he's, he's counted about 150 or 160 different incidents of anti-Semitic harassment in the, in the years that he's lived, the street harassment, just walking down the street, people throwing bottles at him, you know, or just cursing at him, and you've seen now, if you go on online, you see these these videos, various journalists, Swedish journalists and uh, Belgian journalists, I think, dressed up as uh, as um, in Orthodox garb and have gone through different cities, and you just end it with a with a hidden camera behind them, and you see this, you know, this 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 harassment actually take place, and again, it's a it's it's abominable. It's not again, not 1933. It's still abominable. Now you've spent a lot of your career uh, earlier covering uh, Middle East, well, still a lot Middle East, but in Middle Eastern regions with Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, in Gaza, in Pakistan, I think you lived in a madrasa, which was a bad Airbnb experience, I imagine. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> what's the? Yeah, you can stay one one night or seventeen years. But so you've seen a lot of Middle Eastern uh, anti-Semitism. Is yeah. is it the same thing as you see in Europe? Does it have different philosophical and spiritual roots? Um, well, so there's three. I think there's three anti-Semitism that are merging. In, in Europe in, into one, because we're so lucky we got three anti-Semitisms, the price of one. Um, there's, there, there, is, there is that, that what I think of that, that ambient European anti-Semitism that, that somehow, thank God, wasn't imported into the United States in waves of European immigration. I mean, we have, obviously, on the margins, but it's not the same thing. And that's, and that's the classic kind of, you know, everything from you kill Jesus to the Rothschilds control the banks to you have big noses to whatever, you know, this sort of the whatever. Um, and and there, that's, that's sort of always hovering. I think the Holocaust made it, um, you, you know, made it a, a, a little bit unpalatable for most people, but, but it, it, you know, the, that, that age is, uh, of t that taboo age is over. So then you have, um, and this is the, the controversial one, um, you have an extreme left version of that. That's the right-wing version. You have the extreme left version of that, which um, casts uh, Zionism in the role of sort of global demon. Um, and, and this is very interesting because I interviewed the prime ministers of France and Great Britain for this story, um, and they both had very, I mean, thank goodness, they both had very strong words about this particular anti-Semitism, and they both define it, again, non-Jews, um, they both define this anti-Semitism the following way. They say that uh, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism when the people who are or, or the proponents of this are arguing that Jews alone among the people of the world don't deserve a state. Um, and, so, and so their argument is that criticism of Israel in left-wing circles is permissible in a free society, but when it bleeds over into casting Israel as this uniquely evil, demonic presence in the Middle East, the cause of all of the problems in the Middle East and Europe, that's when it goes over. And on the extreme left in Europe, you see this in, in a very, very... Uh, prevalent way. And then those, those feed the third anti-Semitism, which is a kind of a traditional uh, extremist Muslim version, rooted in, in, in some Quranic sayings, rooted in hadith uh, about Jews. Uh, remember, I mean, the Jews don't look very good in the Christian Bible. They don't look very good in the Quran either. And so you could take out from these books what you want. Um, and, and, so, and so that, and then that gets filtered. And the interesting thing about the, the movements of anti-Semitism is that, you know, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a European product. The place where you can buy copies most easily now is in the Middle East. Um, and, so, and so if you read the Hamas Charter, which is, uh, which is almost the, the platonic ideal of an anti-Semitic document, um, you see traditional Muslim tropes about, um, about Jews. Um, you see traditional you know, right-wing European tropes, protocols kind of stuff. Uh, and then you see extreme left tropes. And, and so all of these things are there. And, and I think the, the, it's, there's a certain atmosphere that's created when these, the, when these three streams merge. Yeah, I guess I have three other streams. Well, I mean, I see Middle Eastern anti-Semitism as almost a narrative uh, to explain the world by locating evil in a satanic group. Right. And then European anti-Semitism being born out of alienation, especially economic dislocation. And then I'm trying to think of my third. I'm having a Rick Perry moment. Uh, uh, American anti-Semitism as marginal and unimportant. Right, right. 
No, I, I, I agree. And this, this is the, to step back one step further, and this is the, the, the joke of any dialogue about anti-Semitism is that it's usually Jews conducting the dialogue about anti-Semitism. And, but anti-Semitism is not a Jewish problem. Uh, I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like when African-Americans gather to talk about racism, it's not actually the group that needs to be talking about racism. Um, and, 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 and so anti-Semitism is one way that um, impoverished, uh, one way that, uh, that, that, that impoverished Muslim immigrants in Europe explain their condition. There's a ready-made ideological package for them. Right. I mean, it's something they can find on the internet. You can radicalize yourself. You can make yourself anti-Semitic in a night by spending your time in the dark corners of the internet. Um, but I, 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 this is not. It's not about the tropes themselves or just an innate desire to hate Jews. Anti-Semitism is a manifestation of a deep European malaise, of a deep European. Pride. It's one symptom of the fact that Europe has been unable to assimilate large numbers of working class Muslim immigrants. You disagree. I'm looking at your face. <laughs> you you know me well, face. brother. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot, of a lot of different explanations for it. You said it wasn't surprising, but in some sense, it is surprising. I mean, it's a modern, African, sophisticated continent. Uh, and why should, it, why should it be there? And it seems to me there's a, there could be an evolutionary explanation which is just outgroups are always going to be outgroups. It could be there's a, a broad cultural explanation, which is that we have entered a period of a lot of economic anxiety, a lot of cultural anxiety, and this has occasioned a rise not just of anti-Semitism, but increased racism, increased nationalism, uh, backward-looking movements from Jean-Marie Le Pen to whoever the guy who's, who's the, the Czech or the Austrian uh, prime minister. Oh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and th so we're seeing some, the product of globalization, we're seeing a, a spread of a whole series of Ugly forms of identity. Yeah, and but and, and I don't I don't I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm saying that that look a, as the saying goes, it it begins with the Jews. It never ends with the Jews. I mean, the people who embrace these kind of thoughts usually have another. There's another basket of the whole basket of prejudices and in um, mythical or magical thinking that that they that they engage in. But but anti-Semitism is the gateway drug in a kind of way because it's so ready-made. It's so antique. It's been been so well developed as a as a psychotic ideology that it's easily accessed. And but but it, again, I'm saying that it's it's some people will be prejudiced because they're prejudiced. Some people are are brought to it because they need. An explanation for their for the the reason that their lives aren't working. That's been traditionally look. That's how it. That's how it rose and and arose again and again in Europe. That's why in 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 the Middle East people explain the failures of their societies very frequently. Egypt is a perfect example through anti-Semitic uh, uh, through an anti-Semitic prism. And it's and it's something very different about America because that that kind of narrative never really I mean obviously in the 20s and 30s Henry Ford and and, and Father Coughlin and, and all that there was always these manifestations but it never really took root in the same way now before the wrath of God swallows us all uh, uh, big vote for Allah uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let, let's talk let's talk about the core question uh, <laughs> Don't laugh at my jokes. Uh, the, I mean, the core question is, should Jews leave Europe? And now, we now there's two sides to that. Is there anti-Semitism? The second question is, how much do you owe your country? And, well, okay. and so I think all of us who are Americans say, should Jews leave America if we had an anti-Semitic country? Or if you're African-American, there's a lot of racism. Should African-Americans leave America? I think our loyalty to America as a proposition and an ideal is such that we would all say, hell no. But it could be that for Jews' relations to, to their homelands in, 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 your, in France, for example, is a different sort of relationship. Yeah. So a lot of them are going to Israel. Um, not only Israel. I mean, a lot of French Jews go to Canada obvious, for obvious reasons. Um, do you think this is God, by the way? God or, or Walter Isaacson, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Whichever is higher. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Welcome to, well, it's a Jewish comedy night. What are we going to do? I can't help it. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? The, um, so so I, I, I take this kind of harsh, I, let me start by not being harsh and saying that it's very hard to tell 
a, a family living in France, living in Belgium, living in Canada, leave your home. That's you know, I, I don't want to sit in, in judgment of the decisions that people make. I do think that um, Jew, one of the things that Jews specialize in uh, is 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 living in, in in denial about reality around you. Other things include gastroenterology and the violin, by the way, um, <laughs> and complaining about the weather. Um, so I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to do. But look, here's the 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 the, the, fun, the fundamental truth and the unfortunate truth. Uh, the, the the basic unfortunate truth of this whole drama is that Hitler essentially won. Hitler set out to erase Jewish life from Europe. It's a core. It was a core principle. It wasn't just some sort of afterthought. Read Mein Kampf. Read the second book. It's all there. Um, and he won in 1939. There were 9.5 million Jews in Europe. Um, today there are 1.2 million Jews in Europe. It's a, it's a math problem. Pew has, has suggested, based on their own studies, that putting aside anti-Semitism, the Jewish population in Europe is going to fall by another 200,000 or so uh, in, in the next, uh, I think it's 20-year period of time. Um, so, so we're in the epilogue anyway. Um, Hitler caused, uh, uh, Hitler, not only Hitler, but other, other trends, but mainly Hitler, caused the centers of Jewish gravity to be moved to to other places, the, the, the ancestral homeland of the Jews, um, Boca, and, um, <laughs> the, um, and also Israel. Um, the, uh, so so, so you, you went into it, you, you got into it, I couldn't help myself, I'm sorry. You know, the Talmud we're, we're, said... We're great it, at funerals. No, no, but the, <laughs> the Talmud says that he, he is a hero who can resist the joke. Or I think the Talmud says that, or the Talmud should say that, and we can't resist the joke. Uh, so, so you have a situation in which 90% of Jews lived in Europe at a certain point, I think as late as 1860 or so. And then, and then it, it's, it's now an afterthought. It's now, and I wrote this in the story, and people in Europe got mad at me, and I said, Europe is basically a Jewish museum and a Jewish graveyard with some very lovely Jewish communities, and obviously uh, people are finding Jewish meaning in their communities, whether it's in France or, or Scandinavia, Belgium, and Italy. Rome has one of the oldest Jewish communities in the world. I mean, actually, it's, it's astonishing if you ask a Roman Jew, uh, this is a way to insult a Roman Jew, is to say, is this community Ashkenazic or Sephardic? And they say, we're before. We're before the split. I mean, they were there, they were there 2,000 years ago, and they were there before the Catholic Church. And so they don't want, I mean, that's a perfect example of a group that doesn't want to leave and gets insulted when you suggest the idea that you don't belong here and you should leave. But uh, my, my, my basic line on it is, is kind of contradictory. On the one hand, don't want to sit in judgment of people. And, with the, with, and also, I say that with the, with the knowledge that Jews don't generally move quickly. There's not going to be a mass exodus. Um, uh, um, and, 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 I, and I have that. On the other hand, there, there is no, it is not, if you are concerned about where the Jewish future in the world is, it's not in Europe. It's just not. And, and it's hard for people to grapple with that, and it's sad, but it is true. I don't find it particularly sad as an American Jew. Like, like most American Jews, um, I, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think I speak for this Jew when I say this. Uh, you, you're Jewish, right? Yeah. Um, the, <laughs> no comment. Uh, no comment. The, um, and I wrote this in the piece. Uh, you know, a lot of us exist because uh, our ancestors made a run for it when they could. I mean, you know, somebody, somebody down the line made a decision, said, this doesn't look so great. Uh, there's this place called New York. I'm going to go there, and, 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 it's gonna, and it might work out better. And so, so I have that bu inherent bias against the idea of flourishing Jewish life in Europe. I admit the bias. But anyway, I, I don't think that there's a bright future. I don't think it's the Holocaust. There's something in between bright future and, and destruction that's going to that's gonna happen over time. Yeah, I will say, well, I li lived, we lived in uh, Brussels for five years, and one thing I noticed about our Belgian and European Jewish friends is all their friends were Jewish, or 80% of their friends were Jewish. And here, you know, you're, it's, you're much more socially integrated into society. It's not that big a deal. It's a very different social feel there that you're, you're in social ghettos, if not literal ghettos. But I, I want to spend, before we get to the questions from the floor, I want to spend a little time talking about America. And I'll introduce it first as the malady of anti-Semitism and what it does to one's mind generally. And we now have a president who's negotiating with an Iranian regime and Iranian leaders that are indisputably anti-Semitic. And we're also at the same time expecting them to be rational and self-interested and basically rooted to reality when they make decisions about developing nuclear weapons. Uh, can you be rational and anti-Semitic at the same time? It's funny you raise this question because it's a question 
we just set that up. Um, <laughs> it's a question that I asked President Obama last month. I, I interviewed him uh, mainly on this basket of subjects. Uh, and, and by the way, he is, uh, I, I know from direct experience, he's actually very concerned about this um, European Jewish exp phenomenon that's going on. <clears throat> um, there's not, you know, it's, it's, it, it puts the, the president of the United States is put in a difficult position to talk about that because he doesn't want to be seen as insulting the leaders of our two closest allies, Great Britain and France, by raising the question of, hey, guys, like, you're liberal democracies and the Jews don't feel safe. But he has, a, uh, I think he's expressed his concern in various ways. Um, one of the questions that I asked the president was that exact question. Um, and, I, and I said to the president, um, here are three separate things that you have said you believe. The first is that um, the Iranian regime is anti-Semitic. Um, and he agreed, and he, in, in this interview, he said, yes, the supreme leader of Iran is anti-Semitic. Um, the second is that um, you consider anti-Semitism to be uh, an irrational product of a diseased mind, uh, you know, as, 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 preju as a prejudice would be, yes. Um, and you've also argued that, and you've argued with more, uh, more and more vociferously, obviously, as we get closer to this climactic deadline next week, uh, that the Iranian regime is capable of making rational decisions in its own best interest and using applying logic to its situation and coming out on the other end um, and he said and I'm going to paraphrase this and he said you know and, and so I, what I said was this is these these three things don't 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 fit well together um, if anti-semitism is irrational then how can you be an otherwise rational person and what he did was he he uh, I, I don't think to tell you the truth that he is that he thought about that much he, he thinks I think in part because he's such a rational person and he finds the idea of prejudice so um, antiquated and, and 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 illogical and kind of repulsive that that he he doesn't really believe that that the anti-Semitism is a core part of their identity. He believes that it's a manifestation of a kind of politically cynical way of getting Arab support for Shia Iran. He he believes that that um, that you know it's 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 more of a tick than it is something that's deeply inscribed in in in, in at the root of the regime. Um, and so and he gave me an answer pretty much like that. And I, I didn't find that that answer very satisfying because the the prejudice that we're talking about is not that prejudice. The prejudice that the or that that leaders of the Iranian regime hold is not the prejudice of, oh man, I don't want to join a country club with Jews, or Jews have big noses, or uh, you know I don't get their humor, or what whatever it is. Their anti-Semitism is a very specific kind of anti-Semitism. It is it is it is a, they they hold a conspiratorial worldview that has the Jews as the puppet masters of the the international finance system of the United States of America of everything that matters to them, and so they refract reality through this prism uh, of belief that, that holds that, that, that malevolent Jewish power explains their predicament. And so I don't believe that somebody who has that is understanding the world as it actually is. That One of the reasons that anti-Semites anti eventually uh, lose wars or, 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 or overcome by events is because they're not refracting reality as it actually is. They're trying to explain away a condition uh, that can't be explained away through the protocols of the elders of Zion. But this is a constant of covering the Middle East, is that you constantly interviewing people who believe in the protocols of the Elders of Zion, who are otherwise kind of sophisticated and certainly very gracious, and but also applaud the Dolphinarium explosion which killed 19 young Israeli girls. There's the, these weird disjunctions. And does this mean that you can never do business or you can do business? or? No, I mean, obviously you can, you can do business. I mean, Israel's had a peace treaty with Egypt for whatever it is, 30 years or more. And, and uh, in Egypt, I, I, I once did a piece in Cairo right after 9-11 on this. I mean, Egypt is the epicenter of this kind of fantastical thinking. The, the, all the publishing houses are there. The TV shows about the Talmud are all produced there. Um, and and you know, they, yet they've managed to maintain this cold peace because there is some kind of practice. So I'm arguing against my argument. What I would say is that when you go in to a business relationship, as we seem to be going into with a regime that, that believes this, you've got to be hyper aware uh, of two things. One is that they're not like you. Like you're not dealing with a guy who's like you, you know, Mr. President. They're not prejudice free. They're not rational about the way they understand the world and, and watch them very carefully. Uh, and accordingly, the second part of that is, and this is where it becomes obviously uh, much more serious, is that, is that just because this is the problem uh, that American policymakers often have in that part of the world, is we don't believe that the fanatics are actually that fanatical because, it, 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 because we mirror image. We, we look at people and say, you can't possibly believe that. I was in Afghanistan in 1998 at the moment that the, the fatwa against the Crusaders and the Jews was issued by 
bin Laden, when he organized Al Qaeda. And I was with a group of journalists and, and, and a couple of people in Kabul. And I mean, the Taliban was in control, but we were, you know, at, at the UN House, and we laughed about it because, you know, this guy, really very few people had heard of, it decided to declare war on all Christians and Jews. And, and this is so absurd on its face. And, you know, we obviously it was a mistake to, to, to laugh that off. And so my argument about the Iranians is, no, I don't believe that the Iranians, if they get a bomb tomorrow, will drop it on Tel Aviv. Um, but I do believe that they want to drop a bomb on Tel Aviv. That they, that a, that a, just as, just as, and again, I have to be careful about a- analogizing the Nazis, uh, but just as Hitler a- had it as an actual goal, a policy goal of exterminating Jews from Europe, that the, the Iranian regime, if it had its druthers, would try to remove physically Israel from the face of the Middle East. That is, that is, a, that is their, in their minds, rational, logical foreign policy goal. And so, and so I worry that Europeans, that Americans, look at that, think of it as so absurd that they don't take it seriously. Let me, one final topic before we open the floor, and that's American college campuses. Uh, their disinvestment campaigns, their various activities against Israel, and in, I guess it's mostly against Israel. Do you regard those campaigns as motivated by anti-Zionism or anti-Semitism? How much of it is a problem here in the US? Um, it's, it's not much of a problem yet. It, it, if, if stagnation continues in the Middle East, um, it will probably grow in, into a problem. This is a, thank you for putting a minefield in front of me to walk through before the question period. Um, the, um, the first thing I would say is that, that the Israeli government can help that situation by behaving differently than the Israeli government currently behaves on a number of fronts. Um, you could lower the temperature on, that was the, rep, the Aspen representative of the Palestine Jay Liberation. Street. Yeah, Street yeah, yeah. Is here. yeah. <laughs> They're having a, they're, they're hosting a dinner with Chabad, weird, weirdly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, um, they, no, I, 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 I believe that there are ways that, you know, it, there, there are, there's a certain view, this is the Netanyahu view, that BDS is like the weather. You can't control it. It's just, it's just the nature of the world is to be anti-Semitic, and it will manifest itself in different ways in different places. I think there are things you can do to mitigate that. I think over time, the, this, the, the, the continued occupation of the West Bank and settlement, more to the point of the West Bank, creates, um, creates a narrative that, that, um, that, that both good people object to and also bad people use it as a wedge against the existence of Israel itself. So, so that's that. Look, it's, it's um, what, what I always find curious about these kind of movements on campuses and elsewhere is that um, the UN Human Rights Council, for instance, 61 resolutions against Israel, I think seven against all the other countries of the world. Don't quote me on the number, but it's, it's that kind of balance. It, it raises a question about proportionality. And so if you are on an American campus and you've decided that the paramount, the paramount human rights cause of our age is to get your college to disinvest from, from Israel, um, but you're happy or, or, or quiescent about the fact that your university has millions, billions of dollars invested in companies that do a huge amount of business in China, um, which is obviously eradicating both Tibet in reality and Tibetan culture and Tibetan religion, for instance. Or, you know, and I, could, you, I can name 50 countries across the But if it's this one thing that gets your goat and that one thing that motivates, then I have to ask, I, I want to ask you to examine your own soul and, and try to understand why you might be motivated in that direction. I don't want to call people anti-Semitic. I don't want to call people anti semitic I don't think people on these campuses even know enough about this issue. Um, and the layers of complexity to, to be labeled anything. I, I just think, uh, I, I think at, at, at the core of this is, uh, is a group of people who seek the eradication of Israel. I agree with the prime ministers of France and England that that is an anti-Semitic goal at its, at its root. Um, I think there are a lot of well-meaning people who see pictures on CNN about what goes on in the West Bank and says, that's not good. And here, oh, here's a cause that I could join that somebody else invented that seems like a, a useful thing. I don't know, you have your own opinion about that? I mean, you've written about this, so why don't you answer the question as well? Because I don't want to stop. I don't want to. I don't want to answer it anymore. <laughs> yeah. No. I think it's well. I think it, the colonial narrative is something you inherit if you've gone to graduate school in the last thirty years, and Israel seems superficially to fit into that narrative. And second, I think there are a lot of college students who are naive about the anti-Semitism that does exist in the Middle East and the conditions that Israel actually faces, and so think the choices are actually easier than they actually are. That's a good answer. Thank you. I should have been given more answers. Okay. We're going to. Um, <laughs> We're going to open the floor. Wait, was that just an insult? Yes, yes. <laughs> a firm grasp of the obvious, Jeffrey yeah. Goldberg. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, we're going to start in the middle. And I'd I'm like a- to talk about another couple of issues. Of concern. <laughs> okay. 
we're going to start in the middle, uh, and then I may throw in some questions in the middle of your questions. I'm not answering your questions anymore. <laughs> Hey, so on the BDS movement, the disinvestment movement, I'm wondering if part of the reason why uh, Israel is uniquely targeted when Saudi Arabia and, and other places with quite obviously worse human rights records are not being targeted in this way is that we, um, that the college students in this country have higher standards for Israel in, in a respectable, in a respectful way, that they say, no, Israel is a democracy, a uh, democracy, uh, I, I should be careful, but a Western-type dem democratic system, we expect better, and they look at some place like a China or a Saudi Arabia and feel like they have low expectations, and so, uh, so they're not as disappointed. Look, that's, sorry, one last thing. That's actually a non... So that's it's a philo semitic kind of thing. It's a non-anti-Semitic explanation, right. yeah. Well, you know, ph philo semites are anti-Semites who like Jews, right? Um, ph you know, philo semites uh, people who... If you ascribe a char group characteristics to anybody, it's, it, you get into dangerous area, even if they're positive. And so, y yes, I, I, I agree with you. First of all, it is legitimate. I mean, this is a, obviously an internal Jewish debate that, that goes on and goes on forever. You know, should we, should we American Jews hold Israel to a higher standard than we hold Syria or Saudi Arabia? Of course. I mean, you didn't wait 2,000 years to get your Jewish state back so that you could be better than Libya, right? I mean, it's like a low, you know, you don't want to set a low bar there. Um, so I think, I think, yes, it's true. I think it's not just college campuses. <clears throat> One of the other things that I've talked about with the president, not only in that interview, but in, in preceding interviews, is you know, he has a very, he thinks about this a lot, a lot more than you would think, and he has a vision of, of Israel. I, I mean, I talked about this when he, was, when he was a senator. He has a vision of Israel as the, you know, the kibbutzim and progressive politics and this benighted people finding its own homeland. And in this last interview that I did with him, he directly equated Zionism to the American Civil Rights Movement. He said they're motivated by the same, the same benevolent forces, right? So yes, and so, so of course you have this vision, you know, and the Jews obviously have no history of being colonialist or behaving in any kind because they never had any power, so you couldn't do anything. Um, so yeah, I, I think that exists. Uh, and I'm and I'm of two minds about it. Uh, on the one hand, I, I wanna I, I want Israel to be the best Israel it can be. Uh, on the other hand, it is a little bit ridiculous when 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 Israel is held to a standard that no other country on earth can possibly be held to. I think in the, the yellow jacket there. Hi, thank you for this wonderful uh, stand-up just before Shabbat. Um, I wanted to ask you: the topic of the conversation is should Jews leave? Europe. And I want to ask you, in your minds, when you dig deep down, should Jews leave Israel? Because today they are the only Jews who are really under existential threat. They have, you know, bombs, shelters, whatever. So if you look in the future, do you think the future is there? Only an Israeli would ask that question, by the way. Uh, no, I don't think the Jews should leave Israel. Can I leave it at that? Uh, no, look, look, what's the difference between, you know, there's, there's three centers of Jewish life, America, Israel, and, and, and Europe. And obviously there's some in South America, South Africa. But, but you know, Israel, the Jews, have, Jews can control their destiny. If Israel, you know, it, the, the, the important thing, and that's what, that's what the Zionist revolution was about, was Jews taking control of their own history, re-entering history in a way. And so, and, and that's where you can... That's where you can fight. That's where you won't have that, that abasing feeling of saying, look, they're only spitting on us. You know? That's what the, the Zionist revolution was about, stopping saying, look, they're only spitting on us. Don't complain. Right? Um, yes, but, but you're, you're, you, the, the thing that's so fascinating and, and difficult about this subject is that, is that the, the place where Jews are physically the safest is the United States. Right? The, the place where Judaism is safest is probably Israel. It's the only place where Jewish population grows. It's the only place where Jews where, where Jews are having large numbers of Jewish babies, right? Um, Europe is neither in, in neither camp. Europe is this, again, to me, almost like a museum in a way. Um, but, but no, I'm not, I wouldn't argue that, and, and I don't know many Israelis who would argue that. I don't think you would argue that. I would think that, that the goal of, of reentering history is to get it right and to keep trying to figure out a way to make sure that Israel has its permanent place in the sun. Uh, and, that's the, and that's the challenge of, of being Israeli. If I, if I could just throw one thing in there. Being an American citizen is not only a, well, it's a conviction. It's a it's dedication to a certain proposition. And Abraham Lincoln fought the Civil War because he was dedicated to that proposition despite all the hostility toward the idea. And being a, a, an Israeli citizen is also a proposition. 
It's a dedication to an idea. And in both those cases, of course, you can leave your country if you get a better job and you want to go abroad to study or you want to work in Silicon Valley. But if you leave under the threat of fear, it seems to me, either from the United States or Israel, that is a moral compromise, it seems to me. You're, you're, you're betraying the conviction upon which you were born into, the conviction of your own country. Now, the question for me is, is being French a proposition? Or is, is being English a proposition? I think if it were me, and it's quite obviously a different proposition than being American, I would regard it as somewhat of a betrayal of some sort of heritage to leave the country just because they were hostile to my people. It would be a surrender of, of some moral quality. Yeah, but that, that's fine in a vacuum, but we're talking about Europe here. I, I mean, it, it's, it, it, I don't think that the Jews owe anything to Europe. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the liberal experiment in Europe, one, one way you'll know whether the liberal experiment in Europe has failed or succeeded is whether Jews feel at home in Europe. Right? But I don't think that the Jews have to sacrifice the safety of their children to make sure that Belgium remains Belgium. I, I really don't. Um, that's just my, my personal opinion. But look, you know, Manuel Valls, the Prime Minister of France, um, and this he said that in, um, right after the, the, the Charlie Hebdo and the, and the, and the Hypercacher attacks, uh, or actually he said it before when I interviewed him on this, he said, it's a totally fascinating statement, and it goes to the, to the heart of how he understands France. He, he's, he's of Spanish origin himself, and, and he said, he said, look, if 100,000 Frenchmen of Spanish origin leave this country, it is not the end of France. Uh, if 100,000 Jews leave France, it's the end of France. It's the end of the Republican idea. The revolution, the French Revolution, the, a, a core principle of the French Revolution was the emancipation of the Jews. Um, and so, so if, if after the French Revolution, if they're all we've been through, that the Jews still don't feel safe here, then this, this, this idea has... Um, is not working. I don't think it's on the Jews to make them to make to make French people, to make non-Jewish French people feel good about their country. I think it's on the part of of the French state and French civilization to make sure that their country is safe for um, among others, Jew, the Jewish minority. Okay, but anyway, well, let's go. Don't give your answer. No, well, we're gonna go. <laughs> you of all people would not run away from a fight. That's my short answer. Me? Yeah. Jeff, um, I want to take issue a little bit with your characterization of Iran as irrational. It seems to me if you, if you say that a country uh, or, or that a person is irrational because they don't see the world as it is, then you start having to draw lines of all sorts of groups of people who are not irrational. I mean, then you have to decide, are the Tea Partiers irrational and the mainstream Republicans irrational? Is Bibi Netanyahu irrational? And so forth. It seems to me perfectly plausible for Iranians or the Iranian leadership to have a belief that is clearly crazy, um, that the Jews control the world, but still to make rational decisions that use that as a starting point. I, I, I think you make an interesting point. Uh, I, I tend to believe that if you, if you inscribe this worldview at the core of your, uh, at the core of, of, of your understanding of geopolitics and the way the international economic system works, um, means that it's difficult to talk to you in a way that I would talk to somebody who basically understands the world, the, the systems of the world as, as, as I do. I, I perfectly, and I, and, I, and I think I made this point clear, I'm perfectly willing to believe that Iranians can sign a deal and can adhere to a deal. I am, and, and a little bit of what was informing my answer was an anxiety um, that I think a lot of people have, uh, and it's a provisional anxiety. The, the anxiety is that, that the American and European negotiators are not trying hard enough to make sure that the deal is ironclad, sufficiently ironclad, that we have visibility into what the Iranians are doing at any moment. I, yes, if the question is, do I trust people who hold an anti-Semitic worldview? Uh, not, whether I, not whether I disrespect them or loathe them because of this, but do, would, I, would I trust them to analyze the world properly and understand uh, reward and punishment and, and understand the, the mechanisms of the international order? No, I don't. I don't trust them enough. Can you make a deal with them? Look, the Soviets obviously had their problems with Jews, and, and they were able to, a, able to sign nuclear treaties. Um, I, I just, um, and you know, to your question, I, I'm thinking about it, you know, uh, as I'm talking, you know, would, would a Tea Party government in Washington, uh, be, could it be trusted to understand the way the world works, the way I understand mainstream Democrats and Republicans to work? Or could I understand a party of settlers in, in Israel completely taking over the government, messianists? No, not, not, not fully. Did they make all the Israelis sit in one corner? <laughs> 
So um, you can settle other parts of this tent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we've seen Mesopotamian jewelry rise and decline. We've seen Spanish jewelry rise and decline. We've seen European jewelry rise and decline. What makes you think that American jewelry is rising and won't decline? And the second question is, you're talking about wandering Jew as a sign of weakness, but perhaps it's a sign of resilience, because the, Jewish, the center of gravity of the Jewish people keeps shifting according to places of prosperity and security and uh, freedom. So if you look at all those two things, uh, those two things, my question is, why is it that you think that uh, you know, European Jews need to leave, whereas in, in fact, what we're seeing is this kind of a global movement, historical. Jews were in Europe. They're out of Europe. They may be back in Europe at some point. So I think the first question might more, be more for me and maybe the second one for, for David. I mean, because I, I, I'll, I'll do the first one, and maybe David can, can add in something on, on the second. I, I, don't, I can't remember what I said 10 minutes ago, so uh, I, I don't think I said that American Jewry is on the rise necessarily. I said it's a physically safe place for Jews to be. I don't think. I think we're actually in decline. I, I don't. I don't necessarily. No, Jewish history is crazy, right? We were supposed to be dead 2,000 years ago. We have finished, kaput, right? I mean, that, that, if, if, if the normal course of events uh, it, it, it applied to, to, to Jewish history, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Um, so I, I, I can't, you know, you can't predict the zigzags of, of, of history. I'm just saying, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at it right now, the way things look, that Europe is in decline. I think American Jewry, I don't want to, let me be very careful when I say it. American Jewry is both... Um, Incredibly robust. I mean, it is the it is the sui generis diaspora experiment. Uh, it's the wealthiest, most influential, um, most educated uh, Jewish community in the history of the of the Jewish exile. Um, but if you the, the numbers don't lie, there was six million Jews 50 years ago in America. There are five and a half million Jews now. There, there is a whole separate basket of issues that we're not dealing with here at, concerning the diaspora about assimilation and intermarriage and the reduction uh, or, or the, 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 the lowering of influence of religion in the lives of elites, you know, all, all these sort of things. So I, I actually think uh, for, for practical reasons that assuming Israel can survive, assuming that both its, its neighbors allow it to survive and assuming it has a government smart enough to figure out a way to survive as a Jewish majority democracy, Israel is obviously the place where, 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 where Jewish life has the best chance of being uh, reborn and revitalized and where you have a large and growing Jewish community. Um, so that, but I, again, I don't want to piss off every Jew in this audience by, well, actually I kind of do, um, <laughs> By, by being a declinist on the American question, but you know it, we're we're you know we're in kind of a pickle right now. But it's you know it's it's a it's it's a different sort of dilemma than than uh, than than a physical dilemma. Yeah, I, the second part of the question is is about how we think about wandering, and historically Judaism has had one piece of holy ground, which is the area around Jerusalem, and every other piece of ground is kind of opportunistic whether it's Ukraine or South Africa or, or New York, you're, you're not really spiritually attached to that ground. You just happen to be there because it's opportunistic for, for you to be there through history or Spain. Uh, and that has actually served the Jewish people pretty well because it's kept them moving to areas what the historians call verges, which are places where different cultures are clashing, where there's a lot of dynamism. Jews have found space in those areas and have profited, I think, historically uh, by being in the most exciting spots of the world at any one time. Uh, and so I do think there is a looser attitude toward a piece of ground that a Jew has even toward New York than a Frenchman has toward Paris. Uh, and so I understand the question about wandering. I nonetheless think in this world we're not only Jews, we are Jewish Americans, we are Jewish French, and we're, we are people of multiple identities. And so I, I think we are rooted to earth and to ground more than all the previous generations of Jews just because pluralism has become more accepted. And so I have a visceral reaction against any desire to move from the peace of the earth, which represents at least a good part of your identity. A Jew in, in Western Ukraine was not, in 19th century, was not a Jewish Ukrainian. A Jew in America is an American Jew. And the American peace is really important. And I assume the French piece is really important. And so we're just more split identity and that we should be more loyal to the peace of Earth, I think.
I mean, look, one of the things that I learned is that I don't think for a lot of the a lot of French Jews that it is the same thing. First of all, three quarters of French Jews are recent immigrants or the children of recent immigrants from Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria. Parts of their families went to Israel. Parts went to France. So they're not feeling that that tie. Where it's interesting is you know in Rome. Uh, or, or in Stockholm or various places where people have been emancipated for a long period of time. They have multiple, multiple generation roots in these places, sometimes going back before the people who now are in charge. Um, and so that's a different question. But I, don't, I, I, I would disagree with you on the French, on the French notion. Way over there on the far right bank. <laughs> I'm going to ask a really pragmatic question. As a British Jew, um, and I've never felt particularly British or, or particularly um, loyal to a Britain idea. Um, and, but I'm Anglo-Saxon in my thought process and mindset and, and whatever. And pretty pragmatically, there's no box on the US immigration form that says, I'm a European Jew, get me out of here. Um, there is in Israel, you can, you can make that choice and, and go there, which is a very different culture from the one I've grown up, second generation Brit. So in order for this question to be answered, then it would have to have a, a an American response to this question to allow this whole potential transmission of people from Europe over here, and how does that happen? And what, what's you know, is there any political will for that kind of thing to occur uh, in this, particularly in the environment right now of immigration control in this country? Uh, I mean, you, you know a lot of leaders in, of this country and, and the, the climate around that. What, what's the thing? So you're, you're, you're asking sort of a, almost a practical question yeah. of what would happen if... if uh, it's, a fascin it's, a, it's a fascinating question um, because this goes to, uh, this goes to a, a, a question about an unfortunate period in American history when there was an opportunity in the 1930s for the United States to take in not even large but reasonable numbers of European Jews and, and, and didn't. It was a very different America then. Um, Look, I don't want to make. The, I, don't, I want to de-dramatize this a little bit. You know, the, the Cossacks are not coming. They're certainly not coming in in, in London. Um, you know, and in, 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 in the British Jewish uh, situation, which we haven't talked about, from what I understand, I spent some time in London uh, uh, talking to people about this. Is slightly that where, where you have in France, you have uh, periodic uh, moments of stone cold terror. In Britain, there's more of a kind of an unease about 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 what might be coming. Um, but, but going back to this point, um, A, there is an Israel. And so there is now, as there wasn't in, 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 the, in the 30s, there is a place that will just axiomatically take you, right? So, so that relieves some of the pressure on other countries of, of the world. I do think, and maybe because I'm uh, an American optimist, uh, I do think that if there was a situation, God forbid, in which Jews really had to run in some significant numbers from certain places in Europe. Uh, I think this is a different America. I think it's a different Canada. Maybe I'm being over-optimistic about history, but, but I think that, that you would find a situation in which, in which this country would be pretty apt to take in uh, uh, quite a few people uh, in, in a way that, I mean, those of you who know the story of the St. Louis, uh, you wouldn't be seeing situations, anything, any, anything like that. Uh, but again, you know, I always say this, you know, there's this expression, the tragedy of Zionism, right? It's used by people uh, to, sort of, to sort of undermine the idea that this was a just notion, that the Jews should return to their ancestral homeland. Uh, to me, the tragedy of Zionism is that, is that Israel was created in 1948 and not 1938. That's the tragedy. The tragedy is that it came too late. There would have, there, you know, it, the, the, the reason that this can't possibly be 1933 right now is that Israel exists, it would not have been the same Holocaust. Jews would have died in mass numbers in Europe still, but it would not have been the same Holocaust if there had been an independent Jewish state that would have taken any Jew who can get there uh, and given them refuge. I don't want to end this hour um, without a little your personal experience with anti-Semitism, because you've more or less spent your career right on the cutting edge of it, face-to-face uh, -face with it, more than most of us. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you to pick a moment from your life and your career to describe looking straight into the face of it, and that could be the times you were taken into custody or the time in the madrasa, just to describe exactly what it feels like to see the, the pure thing. Uh, hmm. That's, so I'm a, one, one of the reasons, I don't do this reporting very much anymore, and uh, uh, I wrote a piece in The Atlantic about this recently, that, that the, there, in the 90s and I guess even after, um, 9/11 until until Danny Pearl, um, 
there was this there is this feeling as a reporter, even a Jewish reporter, that you're surrounded by this protective bubble. Uh, it didn't really exist, but it was there, and so you could have these encounters with extremists that you no longer um, can have. So I don't do that much of it uh, I I anymore. Um, but I, it's it's what. It's, it's a very odd thing, because I spent a lot of time in Pakistan, right, which is, is, is the classic example of a country without Jews that's, that's, that's very anti-Semitic, right? The, 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 the discourse, the dialogue, the, 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 the newspapers. Um, but one of the things that I learned about anti-Semites is that, is that they're, they're obsessed with this thing that they don't know. I mean, because if you're an anti-Semite, you're not going to have a lot of Jewish friends, not because you don't necessarily want the Jewish friends, because the Jews don't want to be friends with you. So I would show up sometimes, and I mean, I literally showed up once in a, in a mosque in Kashmir. Um, and, uh, and this is at a time when I was, I was younger and a little bit more foolhardy, and I, I felt for a number of reasons that I should never hide my Jewishness when I'm doing this reporting, in, in part because it stimulated interesting discussions, um, and in part because I didn't want to you know, I didn't want to be self-abasing in that in that kind of way. So I showed up in this in this in this mosque, and I was talking to some some people, and it came out that I was Jewish, and they started calling all their friends because it was so. You know, when you're an anti-Semite, it's very hard to be an anti-Semite because you don't know any Jews. So the, the opportunity to talk to a Jew it was overwhelming in this village. And so, like two hours after I showed up, I was giving a seminar on the Torah, which I'm not fully qualified to do, by the way. Um, and, and answering their questions. I was taking questions from the studio. He was getting pledges from the Federation. I was getting, yeah, no, no. By the way, <laughs> by the way. And I sold $20,000 in Israel bonds. It was incredible. Um, but to, 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 answer your, to answer your question seriously, there's two kinds of anti-Semites. There's the impersonal anti-Semite, and then there's the personal anti-Semite. Um, most of the people I, I dealt with in, uh, in, in, in the, the band of Muslim extremists I was is with, um, were very impersonal anti-Semites. I mean, when I showed up at the madrasa, uh, I told you the story before, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, um, when I showed up in the madrasa, uh, I was brought to meet the head, uh, uh, Milana. Uh, this is the madrasa, by the way, where uh, they, they only gave uh, one honorary degree, uh, two, one to David Brooks, um, and, and the second honorary degree. commencement. Yeah, you year. did the commencement. <laughs> uh, one to David Brooks, and the second one they gave to Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban. I mean, so that's the kind of place this was. Um, and, and, you know, 7,000 students, most of whom, this was in 99, 2000, most of whom are probably dead in Afghanistan by now. Um, and I met the, lead, the leader, and I told him what I, was, what I wanted to do. I wanted to stay there and learn what they were learning and see the, the rhythm of life and the pattern of life. And, you know, first of all, so when you show up in these situations, there are gracious, they're axiomatically gracious, it's cultural, you know, they, so they have to eat like, watermelon and have a, some tea. And, and, and in trying to... In trying to um, to, to, to become friends with me in a kind of way, he, he kind of leaned in and he said, he said, look, you know, the, the problem is not between us Muslims and Christians, it's the Jews. And I looked at him and I made a choice there and I said, he said, uh, uh, I said, you know, I'm Jewish. And he reeled back a little bit, looked at me and he, and he said, well, you are most welcome here. And, and I was. And that to me is the definition of the imper He had, the, the Jew for him is not a person, it's this, it's this abstract, concept that is making life miserable for him, but it's not a person. I, I, would, I would take that over, over the, 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 the person who has a kind of class problem with Jews or a kind of, I would much rather take that than um, a, a woman I met um, in London recently who didn't know I was Jewish, who made some kind of nose joke about another Jew. I would take that uh, any day of the week, even though that person is not dangerous and the other one is. Okay, of all the panels on anti-Semitism, we like to think ours was the third funniest uh, so thank you, Jeffrey Goldberg. Thank you.